Good afternoon. My name is Jens Hoffman. I'm deputy director of the Jewish Museum in New York and also one of the curators of the exhibition Unorthodox. And uh, in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to give you a tour of the exhibition Unorthodox. I'm going to explain you uh, the premise of the exhibition and then we're going to wander around the gallery to look at a few examples of artworks that are included in this exhibition. Um, you might wonder, what does an exhibition titled Unorthodox do at a Jewish museum? And of course, uh, when we thought of the title, we realized that uh, there was a slightly provo provocative touch to uh, the exhibition titles. But uh, the exhibition is not about um, unorthodox religion or questioning orthodox uh, belief systems. It is an exhibition that looks at orthodoxies in the plural. It looks at artists that have made work that tries to overcome conventions and traditions um, in art making today. The history of art is full of moments in which artists have tried to uh, break the status quo. When you think about art movements such as surrealism, situationism, constructivism, or even fluxes, all of those art movements began to uh, think of ways to overcome the norms of their time. When we begin thinking about unorthodox, me and my co-curators, Kelly Texter and Dan Palmer, thought, who are the artists today that are trying to do this? Who are the artists today that are trying to invent new artistic and visual vocabularies? And the artists that we have brought together in Unorthodox are a good example of some of those artists that do that. What is important to note is that, of course, Unorthodox is only one sentence in a longer sentence in a longer conversation uh, about what unorthodoxy could mean. So please follow me now and let's have a look at some of the artworks. And uh, you can uh, send us questions anytime, um, wherever we are, about the exhibition or about some of the artworks uh, that we are looking at. <clears throat> I wanted to oh, I wanted to point out the, uh, the, the ceramics hats here by Clayton Bailey first. Clayton Bailey is an artist who was originally from Wisconsin and um, he now lives in Northern California where he was uh, moved to by his parents during his teenage years and at that period in the 1950s there was uh, an art movement that were called fun art, non, not art and that he became part of. He was also a scientist and a lot of the works that he has done deal with uh, the human figure in almost sort of grotesque, surreal um, ways. So here you see a, a selection of some of these jug heads that Clayton Bailey has done um, in the 1990s. One of the things I should say probably about the exhibition is that um, it's very intergenerational. We have um, artists that were born in the 1910s, uh, like Sanchi Chavinsky, all the way to artists who were born in the 1990s, like uh, Jamie and Giuliano Vigliani. So it's a wide spectrum of artists in terms of generations, but also in terms of uh, cultural backgrounds. Artists coming from the Philippines, from South Africa, from Japan, literally all over the world. We have a question, what's the noise in the background? Oh, what we are hearing right now is some of the video installations uh, that are part of the exhibition, and perhaps we could just uh, sneak into one to quickly uh, take a glimpse of uh, one of the video installations. So let's just have a quick look over here. Jens, we have someone know. watching from Russia who says hello. Hello from, to Russia. This is a video work by Dino Seshevo Pape. Uh, she is from uh, South Africa, and this is a video that uh, talks about the relationship with her partner in the breakup and she uses uh, this sort of very simple digital animation um, for this film. What we were interested in in most of the films that we are showing here is also the incorporation of uh, um, cartoon elements and graphic elements into a lot of the work. Just as a quick glimpse into one of the video spaces. What we're seeing here uh, are artworks by Alice Meckler. Alice Meckler is a New York-based artist. She was born in 1931, uh, which makes her 84 years old. She has done work uh, throughout her entire life and um, was part of a ceramic workshop in uh, the West Village for many years, where she created these small-scale um, 
ceramic objects. You could consider them as portraits of her friends or maybe even self-portraits. Um, what is astonishing is that um, she only had her first solo exhibition last year in a small gallery in the Lower East Side and um, only now really became uh, better known or recognized within the art world here in New York. And if anyone has any questions... If anybody has any questions and uh, the voice you're listening to is from Jens Hoffman, Deputy Director at the Jewish Museum and Co-Curator of Unorthodox. In the background there you have uh, some paintings by uh, Birgit Megale. Birgit Megale is uh, only about half the, the age of Alice Meckler. She is a German painter and many of her paintings she depicts uh, famous uh, women um, that she places into other contexts. This lady that we're seeing here right now is a portrait of Catherine Deneuve, the uh, French actress. Uh, on the far right over here we have um, an actual self-portrait of the artist uh, coming after the this cocktail that you see here. So both artists, Alice Meckler as well as Birgit Megale, are interested in the representation of uh, the female. Um, if we continue, do we have more questions? Yeah, come tomorrow. Very good. Marie Louise Eggman. Marie Louise Eggman is another artist that deals with uh, the role of the female in society, and she often depicts these uh, domestic interiors. Here you see a woman um, in her living room watching uh, television, and a sort of dom domestic scene unfolds in which uh, she has a guest. There's a, her pet is there. Our friend from California wants to know what's the artist's full name again? Marie Louise Ekman. She's Swedish. Marie Louise is a quite well known artist in Sweden where she is one of the um, leading figures of, of pop art and feminist art, um, but she has never had any exhibition or exposure here in the United States. We felt like also, again, there's a certain naivety to the work that is interesting. The human body is again in the center. Um, we also like the, the, uh, the felt and the, the fabric that she is using. And, and, and it actually ends rather tragically with her uh, being covered by the table and, and, and dying. And um, here you see um, sort of how perhaps Marie-Louise sort of like envisions also uh, the female in a male-dominated society and that there's only one escape, which in this case is very tragic. This is a piece that was done in 1970. So we're walking down the uh, corridor. F. Mark Pensato, an artist from uh, Brazil, he's um, also made work for uh, um, since the 1970s. He uh, goes to uh, flea markets, uh, in Brazil, where he finds most of his um, material. Again, it's very feminine. Um, that's what he speaks about. Uh, he's, again, very similar to Marie Louise Ekman, interested in interiors and relationships between humans. Um, he says that he uses uh, f feminine materials like textiles or, as you can see in these pieces, embroidery. These are sort of portraits of fantasy characters. Uh, this is uh, Jens Hoffman, Deputy Director of the Jewish Museum and Co-Curator of Unorthodox. And we are in the middle of a tour of our new exhibition Unorthodox that opened last Monday. And I'm taking you around the exhibition and telling you a few more details about some of the participating artists. Um, please don't forget to ask questions. Questions are always important. We like to have a good dialogue with uh, our visitors, uh, whether they're here in the space or um, out there in front of your screen. What Jens, we have a question. How do all of these relate to you? To how they relate to me or how they are related in general? related together. Let us know a little bit more what you know uh, about that, uh, or what, what your question is, whether it relates to the museum or how it relates to Jens. You want to um, relate, relate in the exhibition. Yeah. Well, what we were looking for were artists that really had um, developed a very unique 
particular visual vocabulary. Artists that did not necessarily belong to any trend, to any artistic uh, group, that, that didn't belong to uh, a certain artistic movement. They were, they're very individual. We sort of like always came up with terms like individuals or mavericks, uh, out, in some way outsiders, without really thinking about the term outsider. But um, well, outsider art, which of course in the art world is its own um, territory, if you will. But you can see that the iconography of these artists here is definitely inspired by folkloristic themes, by uh, um, working with craft, uh, as I said, textile, and, and, and um, working with um, like folk uh, material, a craft material is something that comes up again and again. And um, so there's a border that we were trying to explore that really sits between what is part of the art system and what's sort of like maybe almost slightly outside of it. Thank you for your question, our friend from California. This is a work, um, there's two large scale paintings of Likan Zikon in this exhibition. Um, he uh, grew up during the Khmer Rouge in, in Cambodia and was uh, directly exposed to the atrocities there, the mass killings, the violence and the war. And that is uh, what uh, comes up in his work uh, quite a bit. There's a lot of brutality there, there's a lot of violence there, but at the same time, these are uh, also extremely beautiful uh, paintings. They're very colorful, very vivid, very tactile. Uh, there's many different layers. Here you sort of like see a globe that is burning full with uh, skulls, but at the same time on some of the stars you also find um, embroidered uh, flowers. Um, so there's something of a mix and ambiguity between horror and beauty. It picks up also very much so on the tradition of, of uh, Khmer art in Cambodia, which is something that we will see in our uh, second piece of uh, the artist, um, where you see uh, mythological creatures of like Cambodian mythology populating the canvas, and you can really feel the, the vividness also of uh, the colors. Um, in the background he uses uh, to cover the canvas um, the packaging material for uh, these uh, smelly sticks, what do you call them? Um, incense, yes. So we really try to also be very um, global with our exhibition and these are all recent paintings that the artist has made over uh, the last year, both of these large scale paintings. Please let us know if you have any questions about this exhibit or anything else you see in the comments. So there's a lot of um, stories going on in these uh, paintings. There's a lot of different layers of meaning and a lot of characters that are populating uh, these canvases. And perhaps there's another artist that sort of like is in, in a very close connection to that, which is Ginny Spota. Ginny is uh, a younger artist. She was born in 1982 and she practices here in New York. And I did a studio visit with her and she does these remarkable paintings where she puts on layers and layers of oil paint onto the canvas, almost like three inches deep of oil paint. Um, we are standing here in front of the painting and we can actually still smell the oil paint. The paintings have not dried yet. And I, I wish you guys were here to smell it because it's absolutely true. You can smell the paint. This, yeah. Can you guys see how deep this is? This painting has such depth to it. Yeah. So what she does is she prepares most of the elements, most of the details, like these uh, hellos, she prepares them um, on uh, another table and then builds the painting almost like uh, uh, someone would make a cake, building layers and layers of, of oil paint on top of, the, uh, of each other in order to create uh, these paintings. Uh, our viewer from California wanted to see it from the side. Does that give you a better perspective of it? Can you see really the three-dimensional quality going on there? Is this a one-time exhibit or will it be moving to other cities? This exhibition is just going to take place here in, um, in New York, but what we are thinking about is to potentially do another version of Unorthodox in a couple of years. We have had enormous response to this exhibition and a lot of visitors have asked whether or not there might be a second or a third part. Um, so we are considering to uh, eventually do that. And that is also uh, the result of us um, coming across so many remarkable artists during our research, which took uh, place over the last two years, that we could have easily filled 10 exhibitions so there's a lot of material that we would still like to uh, show and bring to the audience. Joey, where are you watching from? 
Let us know in the comments. We'd love to know where you're from. Yes, and please uh, feel free to ask uh, more questions. We are at the Jewish Museum. Um, my name is Jens Hoffman. I'm deputy director here and also the co-curator of Unorthodox, the exhibition that we are visiting. Joey is coming to us from the Bay Area of San Francisco. Um, how long is this on display? This exhibition will be on display till March. So if you come and visit over the next couple of months, make sure when you come to New York to visit the Jewish Museum and see our Orthodox. Joey, we'd love to see you here in New York. Uh, I just wanted to quickly point out the uh, two oldest works in the exhibition. These are done by an artist called Santi Shavinsky. Both uh, were made in the early 40s. And they create this, these hybrids between um, humans, or um, creatures and, and tanks. How are the artists chosen? So the process really began by us looking at a few artists that we felt were particularly unorthodox. And we will come across one of these artists later on called Boris Lurie. Um, and then really starting and building from one artist, we sort of looked at other artists that were in dialogue with this artist and, and saw other artists using similar visual vocabulary. And it sort of expanded from there till we got to uh, about 80 artists, of uh, which we then ultimately included uh, 55. Um, one of the things that is very remarkable about this exhibition, and maybe we can take a swing around with the camera, is that it doesn't feel particularly static. No matter where you stand, you see juxtapositions of various works, you see connections, you see um, the human figure reappearing again and again, really making connections between faces, bodies, um, and none of them are actually like photorealistic. Uh, representations of the human. They are more um, often hybrid characters uh, that sit somewhere between a human uh, or animals, uh, really sort of taking up between the space up between machines, robots, uh, as you can see here. Miriam Benani, a quick look into another video. Miriam is an artist from Morocco. Uh, she works a lot with uh, video and animation and um, this is uh, a work that talks about uh, the suppression of uh, Muslim women in um, North Africa and specifically in Morocco where she grew up. It's a beautiful soundtrack here. <laughs> One of the uh, large-scale work that we have here in this exhibition is this piece by uh, New York-based artist Park MacArthur. Park MacArthur um, often in her work addresses her disability. She is uh, um, in, a, is in a wheelchair and uh, all of these um, signs that you see here are signs from throughout the United States that designate parking spots for uh, people with disabilities. Um, what she's telling us here is that a one-way street has a particular symbol that we recognize throughout the United States or any other sort of traffic rule has a sign for it that is, um, has a norm. Whereas the signs that designate a spot for disabled parking do not have any norm. So in each state they come up with their own sort of design for this. What she's taken out of all of those is this is where usually you would have the symbol of the, the wheelchair. She's taking that out and created these almost abstract looking um, two-dimensional works that maybe remind you of like abstract uh, color field painting, if you will. These are works uh, here, these sculptures by Dan Simpson. She's an artist from uh, Chicago. And all of those uh, sculptures, again, take on, represent the human body and are three-dimensional forms of um, patterns that you use in order to uh, saw and make uh, dresses. She uses a mesh and met met sort of thin metal uh, to make these very beautiful and exquisite sculptures. I spoke already about the global reach of uh, the exhibition and the artists that we are included in. You see this whole array here of ceramic works um, by a South African artist. His uh, name is Hilton Nell, 
and um, he lives about uh, an hour and a half outside of Cape Town in the bushes, uh, has a little cabin there and is uh, working day in day out on his ceramics. Um, they often um, address his relationships, uh, love, um, male identity in various ways um, and they're extremely um, comical. So this is all work that we found there in outside of, of Cape Town in the middle of nowhere where he lives in a little very beautiful house. So Let us know if you have up. any questions yes. about these ceramics. You have to imagine that when you come to his house, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these plates. We could only bring in like a tiny fraction. Um, 1% of 1% what is actually in his house and he also gives a lot away so um, this is sort of like a very small little overview um, and when I saw them I had like this instant obsession with them mm -hmm. just uh, so intricate and, and, and fragile and colorful <clears throat> okay so uh, we are here at the Jewish Museum and we are visiting the exhibition Unorthodox. And my name is Jens Hoffmann. I'm deputy director of the museum and uh, co-curator of uh, this exhibition. Um, and I'm guiding you around the exhibition and showing um, you a few of uh, the artists that are participating here. And I wanted to uh, move on to uh, show you uh, a painter who has sent us work from uh, Turkey. Her name is Gulzen Kara Mustafa. She was born in 1946 in Ankara and um, has emerged to be one of the leading artists in, in Turkey. The works that we have here in the exhibition are works that are from an earlier period. They're mostly done in the 70s and 80s and they address the uh, dictatorship uh, in, in Turkey quite a lot and um, also the disappearance of many people during the dis dictatorship, the violence and, and the civil uproar that uh, happened here. So let's have a quick look at some of these uh, beautiful uh, paintings here. This is, for example, made for the 1st of May, which is uh, traditionally the, uh, what we call in America Labor Day. Um, one of the demonstrators there was, was hit by a bullet, perhaps. There is a photograph of a family looking out the window um, and a soldier is searching another man or perhaps arresting him. This is a very beautiful, um, it's almost abstract uh, work where you see in the center a woman sawing and she's surrounded by these red flags and um, um, sawing these red flags for the demonstrations. <coughs> So uh, let us know if you have any uh, questions about any of the works or uh, the uh, exhibition. Can you repeat the artist's name for these paintings? Yeah, her name is Gülsen Kara Mustafa. It's a little hard to pronounce, but if you go onto the website of the Jewish Museum, all the artists that are participating in this exhibition are listed there. And we're also going to bring this here in view, Gülsen Kara Mustafa. This is um, works by Amika Toren. He is an artist who was born in Jerusalem in the 1940s. And um, as you can see, he cuts out pieces of the canvas um, in all three of those pieces. And what he does with this material that he cuts out is that he pulps it. And this is what he uses then to cover the rest of the painting with, almost um, creating a painting on top of a, all the destroyed painting and creating these Forms. It very much reminded me of, uh, of skin, of our skin, so also relating back to the body that was uh, such a central element in our exhibition. On the other side of Amica Turin, we have a very interesting artist, uh, David Rosnack from Portland, and I met, and we have a question, how many people visit your museum? About 600,000 visitors per year. Um, 
David Rosenack is a painter from Portland, Oregon, and he was very well known for his extremely photorealistic paintings. Um, it was very hard to actually look at the painting and, and realize there were paintings, they were so uh, precise. But what happened, unfortunately, is that the artist uh, became sick, he uh, started to have Parkinson, um, which of course is uh, not a good thing to have in general, but if you're a photorealistic painter, it really completely destroys uh, your entire career. Um, and what David uh, did was he trained for many, many years to paint with his left hand until he came to a quality of the painting that he felt was satisfying enough uh, for him or equal enough to the way that he was painting before with his uh, right hand. However, during this process of switching from one hand to the other, um, David lost the ability to see colors and became colorblind. So what we see here now are uh, these very small scale painting um, um, in black and white. We just had a question here and we are asked uh, what inspired us to make this exhibition. Well, what uh, our main goal was to really look at artists that are outside the norm, artists that you would not necessarily see in other museums in New York or in the galleries in New York, all artists that have not shown in New York and have a very particular visual vocabulary. I think David Rosnack is a very good example uh, of that. Um, if you can imagine, you tell someone that you know um, there is a painter who's Parkinson and uh, is colorblind, that's quite a handicap for uh, being a painter and being successful. So when we met him, we were extremely moved about his uh, story and, and about the work. And he can only make about one or two paintings a year because it takes him such a fundamentally long time to do this. Perhaps to uh, conclude our tour, um, one of the, the, the big attractions here of our exhibition is a very beautiful piece by Michael Bute. He is an artist from Germany who uh, unfortunately already died in the 1980s. And what's very interesting about his story is that he went to the very famous, very acclaimed art academy in Düsseldorf, Germany, where he was a student of Joseph Beuys, who was in one of the most important German artists of the post-war period. Bute was one in the same class as other um, very well-known German artists like Sigmar Polke or Gerhard Richter, who are considered to be among the top artists of the last 50 years. Um, however, unlike Polke and Richter, Bute um, did not stay in Germany. He went and lived in the north of Africa, and particularly in Morocco for a long time. And this sort of like... Uh, visuality of Northern Africa and the mountains, the desert, all those elements influenced his work dramatically. Uh, so there is a sort of touch of ethnography even, if you will, in his work, where he picks up on a lot of elements that uh, he encountered and experienced on his journeys uh, through the desert of uh, North Africa. So what you have here is this really beautiful, colorful canvas. And when we move back a little bit with the camera, you see that Bute just stuck a big stick, a big branch of a tree right through the center of, of, uh, of the painting, coming out here on the left and the right, kind of covering much more space than a painting would normally do that is sort of like confined by the frame. So in some way, this uh, painting symbolizes our exhibition in the way that you could think about a regular exhibition taking place within the confines of the frame. and. Now these artists are the branch, they are going beyond the frame and occupying other territory, previously sort of not accessible to them. Let's uh, show our appreciation for this uh, final piece by giving us a bunch of hearts. Can you give us a lots of likes, guys? We really appreciate those hearts. This incredible, incredible piece. Very unorthodox, I think. This is it. This is unorthodox pure. And we, yes, thank you for all your support. And yeah, it, this concludes our tour of Unorthodox. I hope it was enjoyable and that if you uh, come to New York or you're in New York, you actually uh, make it here to the Jewish Museum. And again, my name is Jens Hoffman, Deputy Director of the Jewish Museum, and we just uh, visited the exhibition Unorthodox.